In this video, we are going through every single week two NFL preseason game, and we are going to decipher to y'all what actually matters for fantasy football. And I just want to rip right off the bat with the Denver at San Francisco game, which was later on in the day. And we'll get back to the earliest games and walk through every single one of them. But this was the most fun game to watch in terms of relevance to fantasy football on both sides of the ball so for Denver I think the biggest storyline of the entire week was Javante Williams returning to gameplay so this dude tore his ACL his LCL his PCL his all the L's all right he took all of them that one human can possibly take from the kneecap and he tore shit up and 10 months removed from that and all offseason they, they said he's ahead of schedule you know he's ready to go he'll be good for week one this was his first game action since the torn uh, ACL and he looked good. He looked good. I'm not ready to say that he's like back to his old explosive self, but I will say I'm more comfortable with Javante Williams now post this game where he's currently being going seventh or eighth round price where I was completely off of it. I'm cool there. Unfortunately, uh, fifth round Javante Williams is inevitable and I won't be taking him there for two reasons. One, like he looked fine, of course, but we didn't really get to see any plays or runs of, of real explosion from him. So I'm still skeptical about that. But the bigger concern here for me is him and Samaji Piran split snaps, right? And that it's week two of preseason. So that doesn't mean like that's how it's going to go all year. But the noticeable part of where Samaji P. Ryan came into the game was any single play where they were third and five or longer was all Samaji P. Ryan's. They split early down work, and then Samaji had all the third and five or longers. That concerns me because that's exactly the fucking role that Samaji P. Ryan had last year in Cincinnati, which made Joe Mixon like the single most frustrating fantasy asset to own. He wasn't good at all last year, but... He had a couple games where he scored a ton of touchdowns and ended up finishing as a good fantasy pick. I'm, I'm worried that Javonta Williams, he did get a ton of work in this game in the passing game. Like he played a handful of snaps and got five targets, which could be their offense this year. But if he's not playing two and four minute drills, if he's not playing in passing situations, I think over the course of the season, that will probably play itself out to him being similar to Joe Mixon. And remember, Joe Mixon's playing in an elite offense. And I don't know what Denver is going to be this year. But the other big takeaway from this game was Russell Wilson, bro. He looked good. He looked lean. Like when was lot we haven't seen definition in Russell Wilson's arm since like fucking pre twenty fifteen, pre war era out here okay and Russ looked lean you could tell he lost like a solid 15 pounds this offseason he was serious about all the critiques that he got he was serious about all the all the chirping coming out from all angles and he put it on display immediately the dude was running he was flying he has to be the same speed as he was like pre-covid because Russ was moving yesterday and that got me excited. They they talked about it. There's a lot of reports, and I never really listened to the, like, he's in the best shape of his life reports. He lost 10, 15 pounds. This is one of the very few examples where it was noticeable immediately, right out of the gate. And this is good for everybody involved in Denver's offense. Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, Javonta Williams, Samaja Piran. So right now, like, sure, if you guys want to keep drafting Jerry Judy, keep doing it. That Again, that that's just not me. I'll keep echoing that all offseason. Jerry Judy's not the guy for me. I would much rather take Cortland Sutton as ADP of like 95 to 105 right now. I think he's going to be a huge target in this offense. Again, Javante, 7th, 8th round price I'm okay with after this game, but he's going to move up to like 5th, 4th round pricing, and I'll be completely out on that. I'm still taking a bunch of Samaja P. Ryan. On the other side of the ball, we got Brock Purdy for the first time since the elbow injury. That elbow injury is very clearly behind him as is Kyle Shanahan. Brock Purdy is the dude. His arm looked quick. His release looked quick. His arm looked explosive. He looked really good in this one. And it reminded us of why it's so easy to score fantasy points as a quarterback in this offense. They got the ball in Debo's hands immediately. He had two screen plays on the first drive that led to 40 receiving yards just off the rip like that. He had a quick strike right to Brandon Ayuk, who almost got into the end zone off of it. And Brock was moving around too. He's he's flexible. He is versatile. He can he can absolutely dance and scramble around and, and rack up some rushing yards. So I'm very much in on Brandon Ayuk. I'm very much in on Brock Purdy as like if he's your QB two in Superflex, don't absolutely love it, but he is like the perfect QB three backup in Superflex leagues. So it was good to see Debo exploding again, but still I'm not taking him back to the third round when Brandon Ayuk is going to be a mid fifth round pick right now. I I I feel really really good about a major Brandon Ayuk explosion breakout coming this year now that we got the fun game out of the way let's reverse it let's bike it up let's tuck our shirts in let's flex our traps and let's take it from the top 
First game of the week was Cleveland and Philadelphia. Cleveland did not play any of the starters. You'll see that as a common theme throughout this episode. So not every team is going to have takeaways because a lot of them rest their starters right now. What I've heard and what I've been told now is that teams are doing, because the NFL lowered the preseason game totals from four down to three last year, there's three preseason games now, a lot of the teams are using joint practices. So a lot of these teams that are playing this week will do joint practices throughout the actual regular week. And coaches will use those as like how they're dictating their players and their snaps and things like that and don't really care much about the actual preseason games anymore. So a lot of guys sit because they saw two or three joint practice games throughout the week, unfortunately. So Cleveland, one of those teams, the only real takeaway I had was Cedric Tillman, their third round pick, who was the first guy that they actually drafted in this draft uh, this year because they didn't have a pick until the third round. Looked really good. I think it's only a matter of time before he gets on the field. Philadelphia, they rested all their starters. And throughout these videos, I'll I'll, pro I'll try to break down as much of things that I've heard throughout the week as well, because I listen to a lot of podcasts. I, one of the single best resources for y'all, if you want to get a couple more football podcasts in your rotation that are not fantasy football, one, that's takeaway number one. Try to get some real like NFL beat reporter training camp type audio into your ear holes rather than fantasy football guys because they have no fucking inside information whatsoever. And it's way more helpful to listen to dudes who are actually at practice and seeing what's going on. So I could not recommend more the athletic podcast where Nate Tice and Robert Mays of the athletic talks to beat reporters uh, from their company that stay at every single camp and they get such good insight from it. So a lot of the takes that I'll have that are paired with the actual games come from him. And when they brought their Philly reporter on, which also echoed the exact same thing that Jimmy Kemsky said when he was at training camp and he appeared on the Established the Run podcast, was like, everybody relax about Kenneth Gainwell. The practices where he was like running with the ones, they were doing specific like red zone drills for the entire practice. So basically everyone is saying that DeAndre Swift is the one there. They want him to be the guy, but he's still splitting early down work with Rashad Penny. Uh, two and four minute drills will go to Kenneth Gainwell. So right now, this feels like a headache. This feels like a mess. This feels like unless you get DeAndre Swift at value, like eighth, ninth round, uh, I wouldn't go out of my way to be picking anybody in this backfield. Carolina at New York Giants. So for Carolina, we got to see some more Bryce Young. He played 21 snaps in this one. Terrace Marshall was out, but he was also with the second team last week as well. So I don't think it affected that much because Adam Thielen, DJ Chark, and Jonathan Mingo seem to be the three guys that are playing basically every single snap. I want nothing to do with Adam Thielen, but I'll be taking shots on both DJ Chark and Jonathan Mingo going forward in double-digit rounds. Hayden Hurst is also playing every single snap with Bryce Young, and he's running a route more than anybody else on the team. So he remains one of the, you know, okay, high-floor, safe, late-round tight end flyers, in my opinion, with the New York Giants. Listen, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if, ready, if I'm ready to take the L on Darren Waller because I've never questioned his talent. But God damn, is he starting to make me question my evaluation on him because the Giants and Daniel Jones came out and it was like the first four passing plays went right to Darren Waller. They were like slants over the middle, which he just like shake and baked. It didn't matter. Cornerback, safety, linebacker, whoever's on him. He is a problem. He is a mismatch for the defense. And that came to fruition like immediately. So he will be moving up in my rankings a little bit. I'm not going to completely pivot off of the way I thought about him, the way I feel about him over the season long portion of, you know, fantasy football, but he's definitely jumping over Kyle Pitts, who I had as a Kyle Pitts is actually moving down my, my list a little bit, just cause I'm so in love with Dallas Goddard and Darren Walters moving up as well. If you look at the receivers, like it's very clear that Darius Slayton is viewed as the actual one there in New York. Uh, Isaiah Hodgins and Paris Campbell also play with the starters. They look fine. It is what it is. They're both like late round guys that you could take a shot on. Jalen Hyatt, people are going to make a lot of uh, hype around like that fucking moonshot that Tyrod Taylor threw to him. Again, it was against the backup, so I'm not getting overly excited. He wasn't really playing with the starters. Cincinnati and Atlanta. Since he rested all their starters, the one thing that I have been hearing a lot about is that Chris Evans is very likely going to play that pass catching role. So if you were frustrated with Joe Mixon and Samaji P. Ryan, get ready for more of that. I think I'm going to move Mixon down a little bit because Chris Evans is very much in line to play the Samaji P. Ryan role and take a lot of the pass catching work away from Joe Mixon. If you think, you know, you like his 10, 11, 12 touchdown upside, just being in this good offense, go for it. But it couldn't be me two years in a row. I ain't dealing with that bullshit on the Atlanta side of the ball. Oh my God. Does the Super Bowl run through us? Oh my God. The fact that we're not favorites in Vegas today is criminal. I might bring a criminal suit against the entire state city of Las Vegas. Settle down, settle down. Bijan Robinson got his first action and holy shit. Did he look good? I feel inspired. 
I feel inspired by Bijan. On, on some real shit, like obviously using a top 10 pick on a running back is like super questionable, but just watching him play, it brought excitement because he's like must watch TV already. He's like brought excitement to me in a way that's like, okay, even if we're not good, I'm going to have fun watching the Falcons for the next five years minimum because of Bijan Robinson. He is the truth and he is every bit worth the first round draft capital that people have been using on him in fantasy drafts up to this point he was running routes on 65 percent of the dropbacks he got a ton of carries he got some some work in the passing game he looks so good and explosive on the ground he's gonna have a monster year and like here's here, here's the question i keep asking myself like maybe he doesn't finish as the rb1 overall maybe you still want to take all these wide receivers over him but if you had to put a percentage, a likelihood of Bijan Robinson being the 101 in fantasy drafts next year, I'd put it really high. I would say he's the odds on favorite to be the 101 in fantasy drafts next year. I don't think that's really a hot take. But it's like, if you're thinking that way, if that is the probability, he's probably a pretty good fucking pick this year. But overall, besides him, like the Atlanta offense looked sharp. Desmond Ritter looked worlds better than Marcus Mariota, which isn't really saying much because he was so bad for us last year. Matt Collins looks like he's going to be a real playmaker for us, which is kind of exciting to have a real two behind Drake London. Oddly enough, Kyle Pitts only played on like nine of the 17 Desmond Ritter snaps. I'm not really sure what that's about. He split time with McCole Pruitt as well as newcomer Janu Smith, who used to play in Tennessee under Arthur Smith. So like notable, I guess I'm not really going to question whether or not Kyle Pitts, who's the fucking fourth overall pick in the draft a couple of years ago, is going to be a full time player. But I, I thought it was worth keeping an eye on uh, Jacksonville at Detroit. Jacksonville didn't play any starters, but Tank Bigsby had a big game. He was playing like the workhorse role with these starters, and he's very, very clearly the guy behind Travis Etienne, though. Because they didn't like rest him in this one while everybody else rested. I do question whether or not ETN. I think ETN is going to be the guy for sure. I think Tank Bigby will work into the rotation, uh, maybe eventually, maybe not much at the start. And I think there's a chance that Jamichael Hasey's the pass catching back there. It's still a backfield I'm kind of staying away from, but it's intriguing. It's one I'm going to keep a very close eye on for the remainder of the summer. Detroit had zero players of notability suiting up in this one. Miami at Houston. Uh, Tua came out and threw a disgusting interception on his first pass of the game and then two uh, and then Twitter was like we knew it he was the worst QB of all time and then he led a nice like 94 yard touchdown drive on the next fucking drive biggest takeaway here is the running back situation once again Devon A. Chain was like fifth string running back and he also left the game with uh he got carted off with a shoulder injury and that's a that's a red flag because that's a concern of people the fact that he's a sub 190 pound running back like when you get landed on by dudes who are 230 240 consistently those things start to add up and you don't want to see like a Dalvin Cook situation where the shoulder dislocations or whatever end up leading to another one and then another one and another one so Devon A. Chain is tentatively off my board completely. Raheem Mostert got the start and got a lot of touches. So I think it's probably about time I start drafting as much Raheem Mostert as Jeff Wilson. But those two, you want one of those two on every redraft team that you leave uh, the draft with because they are like 12th, 13th, 14th round picks, and they're going to get so much work in this offense. Raheem Mostert, if he's healthy, will get a ton of touches. That's fine with me because he gets hurt all the time. Draft a ton of Jeff Wilson. But those two, you want to just continue targeting and targeting and targeting. And in Houston, you want to keep targeting Damian Pierce. The starters in Houston played 14 snaps. CJ Stroud actually played like the entire first half, but the starters outside of Stroud, like the pass catchers and everybody else, played on 14 snaps, the first two drives. And Damian Pierce was in on every single one of them. Pierce is going to be a menace in fantasy football this year. He's my favorite running back two in drafts right now. This is a quote from Nathan Janky, who does awesome work at PFF, recapping all the preseason games. Last year, Damian Pierce played on 3% of third or fourth and five plus yard snaps. So if it was third and five, fourth and five or longer, Damian Pierce played on 3% of those snaps last year. In just these two drives in preseason week two, he took four snaps in those situations. There is a changing of the guard there. And Damian Pierce is the guardian of the goddamn galaxy down there in Houston. So Damian Pierce is really my, my only takeaway here. I just want to say as well, we'll be doing this every single week for the rest of the preseason. So subscribe to the channel if you're new and you want to hear these week in and week out. But we also have our draft guide ready if you have your draft coming up this week or next week or whatever. It has all of our rankings updated pretty much daily as soon as games happen. So we have them for one quarterback leagues, for super flex leagues. We have all the positional rankings as well. And all of my preseason weekly write-ups are in here, right? As soon as the games happen, like I'm filming this on Sunday morning. And I've already done all the write-ups for all the games that we're playing on Saturday, even the fucking 10 p.m. games, all right? We are out here, and we are dialed in this summer. So everything I'm kind of talking about right now, all the numbers and everything is organized and laid out for you guys in the draft guy right now. It updates again almost 
borderline goddamn near real time. And you can get it in one of two ways. You can get it at full price on bdge.shop. That's our website, so directly from us. But the cheaper and discounted way to get it, and the best way, I think, for you guys to get it is through Underdog Fantasy. So if you download the Underdog app, which is the first link down below, it'll take you to the App Store, regardless of what kind of phone you have, and you deposit $10 or more. So full price for the draft guide is $25. But you can get it through Underdog Fantasy for $10. If you deposit $10 on there using promo code BDGE, so when you deposit, there'll be a little promo code slot, BDGE, throw it in there, and not only will you get the draft guide emailed to you for free, but they'll double what you put down on the platform so you can draft with us on Underdog, and we'll be doing a ton of pick em slips throughout the year on Underdog. So that's the best way to support the brand. That's the best way. That would be the way that I'd suggest you guys go get the draft guide is through Underdog Fantasy, but also available on BDG.shop if you want to go directly through us. It's got everything you need for your fantasy draft right there. Mwah, 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 mwah. Let's move on to Buffalo at Pittsburgh. I think the only real takeaway I have here is that I probably need to take James Cook a little bit more seriously. He's had like an 85% snap rate with the ones. He hasn't really done anything that's impressed me, but those numbers, I'm trying to be objective here in the preseason. We don't really, we try not to look at stats. We try not to look at like, I don't care about the box score outside of usage and, you know, volume with the starters. That's the way I look at preseason. James Cook's numbers are really high up there. And everything I hear about reporters out of Bill's camp are that like James Cook is clearly the one, but they all say that he's not going to get short yardage work. They're all starting to say that Latavius Murray is getting that over Damian Harris. And I, again, I tweeted this out like a few months ago and I was like, here are dudes that people would be shocked if they got cut, but you shouldn't be. And uh, Damian Harris was on that list. He's falling behind Latavius Murray. Rashad Penny was on that list, and I don't think he's going to get cut, but there were now rumors like a few days ago saying that Rashad Penny might not make the final 53. These are all things that I think are obvious to see coming from pretty far away, and now we're seeing it come to fruition. So I still think Latavius Murray ends up taking the short yardage and goal line work and possibly some early down work, but James Cook is going to make probably a lot of explosive plays. So like I'm not completely fading him, and I moved him up my rankings a bit, but I still have hesitation based on his size and lack of probably being able to handle a workload. Dalton Kincaid looked phenomenal in this game, though Dawson Knox did miss the game because of finger injury. So like the actual usage from Kincaid is probably a little bit of fool's gold right now. So we'll have to watch what happens next game on the Pittsburgh side of things, man. The Steelers are on fire this off season, dude. Kenny Pickett looks like he has already taken that jump up from last year to this year. The Steelers offense, man, like here's, here's what I'll say. And I'll continue to echo this about Najee Harris being overdrafted. I've been saying it for like two months now. And you guys continue to fucking push back on me for this. Najee Harris, the first third down they had in their first drive with the starters, he was pulled in favor of Jalen Warren, which continues to happen. He continues to take all those situational snaps away from Harris. They got a first down on the very next play. They kept Jalen Warren in on the first down. He rips away for a 62 yard touchdown run, looked explosive, something that Najee Harris literally has never looked throughout his NFL career. So I'm starting to think that even I, I got to a point where like, OK, Najee's going at like the 4-2, 4-3, 4-4. I'm like, this is good value. I'm starting to think that even at that price, we are overpricing Najee Harris right now because I think he's just going to be a two down thumper and that's it. And then from the receiver side of things, all the hype about Allen Robinson being the big slot guy is coming to fruition. Deontay Johnson. Allen Robinson and George Pickens are running all the routes on Kenny Pickett dropbacks. I still like Deontay Johnson the most, but can definitely acknowledge Allen Robinson, like 17th, 18th round of best ball drafts. You can do worse. And George Pickens' breakout year very, very well might be uh, something coming on. But Kenny Pickett, absolutely huge winner from this game. Chicago and Indy, we did not see any of the starters play in this one. I think the only notable thing was like Deontay Foreman played with the starters and played on 100% all 11 snaps with the starting team. Uh, Roshan Johnson is the clear RB3 there for now. He he continues to play really, really well, but like it's not making a difference in the depth chart. So let's just rest easy on that still. Tampa Bay at New York Jets. Uh, Tampa Bay rested all their starters. The Jets rested all their starters as well, but that was not Alan Lazard or Miko Hardman. They played the full, you know, starter snaps with the backup quarterback while Garrett Wilson and Corey Davis are the clear one and twos. So we wrongly, or the fantasy community, I, I drafted no Lazard, but they kept drafting Alan Lazard all summer as if he was the two. It is very clearly Corey Davis. New England at Green Bay. We got to see 11 snaps out of Mr. Mac Jones, Devontae Parker, and Juju. Kendrick Bourne, Hunter Henry played almost full-time roles, and they'll be like the you know, full-time guys, I guess, for Mac Jones. Unfortunately, that's a disgusting fucking group to have to you know throw the ball to. Ramondre Stevenson also 
played on all 11 snaps. So 100% of the snaps with Mac Jones. He ripped off some chunk plays. He even got a two-yard touchdown run, which is great to see because Zeke is coming in soon. He's going to suit up, and he will be a problem for Ramondre Stevenson on the goal line. But if he shows well, if Ramondre Stevenson shows that he you know, improved on the goal line, then maybe that salvages a little bit of the percentages. Like maybe Zeke was going to be a 70% goal line guy, and maybe now it's 50-50. So the touchdown upside goes up a little bit. I'm reaching here, but I, I still really like Ramondre because he's a really good player. Green Bay, Jordan Love, man. If I didn't say it loud enough for y'all last week, we need to start taking this offense more seriously. Jordan Love, 17 snaps. It's so condensed. It's so clear what their offense is right now. Christian Watson, 17 snaps. Romeo Dobbs, 17 snaps. Jaden Reed, every snap in the slot, 9 of 17 snaps. Every time they went into 11 personnel, Jaden Reed was a slot guy. Luke Musgrave, 17 snaps. They have their full-time players. We know exactly who they are. Luke Musgrave needs to shoot up your tight end rankings. Romeo Dobbs needs to shoot up your wide receiver ranking. He is, right now, he is basically my favorite, like, 10th round pick in all of fantasy football. Romeo Dobbs needs to be on every one of your fantasy teams. I promise you. Jaden Reed's a late round, like, upside guy. I think he's a fantastic route runner. I think he'll have his, his big weeks. Um, I'm excited about him. But this offense is one that's, like, very condensed with their weapons. And I'm really excited to see them, like, continue getting better. Uh, Tennessee at Minnesota. The Titans rested all their guys, but Chiggy, Chiggy suited up and played a lot. Uh, he did play 100% of the snaps from the 11 personnel, which is kind of good. I mean, like playing with the backups, not great, but the fact that he played every snap from 11 personnel is big because he only played 17% of the snaps last year on 11 personnel. 11 personnel is three wide receivers, one running back, and one tight end. So anytime they went to one tight end, it was basically Austin Hooper on the field. Now it feels like it's going to be Chiggy, which is big. So he might get off to a fast start if Traylon Burks is hurt. Tajay Spears also looked awesome. No idea if his his workload might be like fucking 6% of the snaps in, in the regular season because of Derrick Henry. But he's making a case that he should uh, have a bigger part. And he should be the handcuff for Derrick Henry. Nothing to see out of Minnesota. Let's move to Kansas City and Arizona. This one fucking fires me up as well. There's nothing I love seeing more than a little Mahomes preseason action. He got 20 snaps. Now it's still nearly impossible to get a real grasp of the wide receiver situation here. It feels like MVS is one of the clear wide receivers on the outside. Uh, he had 16 of the 20 snaps. Sky Moore had 13, but Kadarius Tony's still out. And he's, if, whenever he gets back on the field, he's going to take a large role in this offense. But there was still a rotation while Mahomes is in the game of Justin Watson, Rashi Rice, Richie James, Justin Ross. That That's still ensued. So, Basically, the way I'm looking at it is like I'm, I'm just approaching in leagues that are not best ball leagues where you actually have to start. You have to decide sit start like regular sit start redraft leagues. Uh, I would I would approach even Sky Moore, dude, who I really like these guys with extreme caution. And I'm probably not using a single digit round pick on any of those dudes. This also goes to the running back situation, right? The longer Isaiah Pacheco is out with this hand injury, the 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 wider the door opens for Clyde Edwards Hilaire, who is playing a ton with Patrick Mahomes. And can't you just see, I, I could just see the storyline happening where CEH has like a bounce back here for no fucking reason, ruins Pacheco. Uh, McKinnon played six snaps, ran around on five of them, caught a couple balls. So like, again, this is such a tricky situation that I'm not investing any sort of serious capital, no single digit round capital on as crazy as it sounds, a Kansas City wide receiver or running back until we get more clarity on the situation. Arizona, Michael Wilson, again, ran the single most snaps, even with Hollywood, even with Marquise Brown playing. Colt McCoy, 15 snaps. Michael Wilson, 14 snaps. He is the wide receiver, too, in Arizona. He is a must draft, like, round 13, 14, 15, 16 guy in your fantasy draft. Late night games, late night creeping. If you've enjoyed the video so far, all I ask, like, we work very hard on this. Clearly, I have a lot of numbers. I have a lot of foundation. All these games just happened last night, and I'm already ready to rip for you. All I ask is that you go down below, subscribe to the channel if you're new, if you want to continue getting these types of videos, and hit the button that looks like this. Las Vegas and Los Angeles. We saw our first Jimmy G glimpse, played in nine snaps. Devontae Adams played in one for some reason, but played one and then got off the fucking game here. Jacoby Myers, he played 100% of the snaps with Jimmy G. Jimmy G looks surprisingly like kind of good. Uh, I'm not about to really like take away anything because the Rams, who rested all of their starters, already have a miserable defense. So like, let's not act like the second string for one of the worst pass defenses in the league is something we should really like put a lot of stock into. 
But Jacoby Myers, 100% of the snaps. He's extremely uninspiring as a draft pick, but he's, uh, I think you could do worse than Jacoby Myers. Uh, still no Josh Jacobs. Samir White looked good again, but he did split like a decent amount of work with Amir Abdullah and Brandon Bolden. So even if Josh Jacobs is out, I still think we're seeing like uh, some sort of split backfield here. Dallas at Seattle. Uh, this is actually going to be the last game I talk about because I am filming this on Sunday and then New Orleans and the Chargers play tonight and then Baltimore and Washington play tomorrow. So I apologies that I am missing out on those two games but I'm sure I'll recap it in tomorrow's video or some shit. Dallas. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys rested all their fantasy relevant players, including Jake Ferguson. He is cemented in as the guy. He is him in this offense. Uh, one thing to note, though, like everybody's favorite five foot five guy, Deuce Vaughn, was the fourth string. He was a third back in this game, which means he is still considered behind Tony Pollard, uh, Malik Davis, Rico Dowdle, which is not great. On the Seattle side of things, Geno Smith played 12 snaps, uh, suited up but was without DK Metcalf and Kenneth Walker. Tyler Lockett played two snaps at the end of the quarter, which was kind of weird, but we'll pretend he didn't play at all. Zach Sarbanet played eight of the 12 snaps and saw a majority of the backfield work. But but what I will say was worrisome, DJ Dallas played like all of the passing down situations. Everything that was third and five or longer, it was all DJ Dallas. He played on four of those snaps. And I've cited this stat before, but during Pete Carroll's tenure in Seattle, which is like 12 plus years now at this point, he has never had an RB1 finish with more than 37 catches. So you're splitting that between Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet and DJ Dallas. I'm not confident in saying that any of them, maybe one of them will, but like I'm not confident projecting any of them to finish with more than 30 catches. And if you're not finishing with more than 30 catches, you got an uphill battle to be like a super relevant fantasy player, especially when you're probably splitting goal line and or early down work with another talented running back. And you got to remember like, you know, Metcalf, Lockett, and JSN are all there zooming up targets. So it's going to be a really tricky duo between Charbonnet and Walker to figure out on a week-to-week -week basis. So for that reason, similar to the way that I talked about the Kansas City Chiefs with their wide receivers and their running backs is like, you don't know how this situation is going to play out. So like best ball, I'm okay drafting these dudes, redraft, they're going to be moving down my board pretty uh, pretty drastically. And that's kind of the way I'm looking at the backfield in Seattle, where it's like the cost of having to figure out when to start them is going to be the problem with these two dudes, despite how talented they really are. Bang. Bang. There you go. I'm actually about to hop on YouTube. I'm I'm about to hop on a live stream YouTube right now to do a mock draft post preseason week two. But again, but if you don't want to deal with all that shit, you don't want to watch all this content, you can go get our, our preseason weekly write-ups. You can go get our rankings for your league type uh, right now. It is available, updated pretty much daily on bdg.shop or by depositing $10 on the Underdog Fantasy app slash website using our code BDGE to do so. They're going to give you the draft guide for free, $10 or more. Plus, you're going to double whatever you throw down onto the platform. I love y'all, and I'll see you tomorrow.